Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, so I think I will dive right in since um, a lot has been said about me already. Um, so my, my research mainly centers on, um, on low resource environments. Um, as much as ICT for development is um, not really uh, the case that it is always about rural areas or always about low, um, low resource environments, um, ICT for D can be done even in developed countries like Amsterdam because um, it is for development and there is always a developmental issue. But the reason why um, we're looking at low resource environments is to so that we can learn certain context-based issues that we may need to tackle. And so by low resource environments, we may be talking of urban areas, but uh, most likely rural areas um, where the some of the resources that we need may not be readily available. Like um, in Andre's um, presentation, he mentioned the issue of being um, taking it for granted that there might be that that there will be an availability of data at all times, um, and um, so an AI system which is meant to use data might not always have data in a low resource environment, and these are the kind of um, issues we want to look at shortly um, today. So there, there have been many ICT for D projects in the global south. Um, the the one laptop per child is, uh, was a very popular one. Um, there were ICT kiosks and um, technology parks and technology hubs. These are the kind of projects that are, um, would have the intention of, of fostering development, especially in developing countries. Um, but to, to zoom into um, other projects that we work on, um, I'll just go through um, a couple of them or three of them. Um, so the W4RA, which is the Web Alliance for Green in Africa, um, we, we have done a number of projects, a lot of projects, but I'm just selecting a few um, so that um, within this uh, presentation, I, I want us to, to look at it in context of some of the projects that we have already done so that we can see the barriers that were faced in these projects, because these are the same barriers that will be faced in AI for development projects because AI is simply a subset of ICT. And so we'll come across the same kind of issues. Um, we have um, a project uh, for Obablong that was um, done quite some time ago in Mali. Um, this was kind of like a, a, a voice-based social media app um, of sorts or a voice-based um, uh, platform that people could leave messages. At the end of the day, the people used it for what, for what they wanted to use it for. So it became um, a, a solution, a system on its own being used by the people. Um, and then there is Mr. Meteo. Mr. Meteo is uh, one of uh, my projects um, within the W4 array and this, um, so Mr. Micho started off in a, a village called Guabuliga in um, a place in the north part of Ghana, um, called, uh, near, near a place called Wali Wali in the northeast. Um, so we, we visited this, this village um, some years ago, and as we began to talk to the locals and we were talking of voice technologies and their mobile phones and the information they get from their phones, and they just happened to come up with this idea by themselves to let us know that they, it would be good to get um, climate information over their mobile phones in their own languages. And so these are ideas that actually came from the people themselves. And so this is a project that I took up with that idea from them. Um, Mr. Michio was, um, we, we actually did a deployment and also tested um, somewhere near Bolgatanga in the upper east region of Ghana, um, together with um, Cow Tribe, which is a company in the northern part of Ghana. Uh, and we, we, we demoed this out to the people. They were actually enthused by, the, by being able to get information from 
of something that they had they had always wanted to get information on, but coming to them in um, through a medium that they understand and in a language that they understand. And so this was um, piloted in Bogatanga. And then there was also um, Tibangsam, which uh, again, the, the, the name Tibangsam was given by the people themselves. We kind of asked them what, what the application should be called. Um, but, but we initially named it RadioNet. So RadioNet was a system that um, provided information over an FM broadcast in the rural community. Um, using very affordable hardware. We used, we used a plug computer, Raspberry Pi, deployed it in a rural area. And the information was able, to, we call into the, the Raspberry Pi and record information, such as, again, we plugged Mr. Meteor into the system, so such as climate information. And then the communities could simply dial their radio set to a particular frequency and they can hear these information on repeat. Um, this was done as part of a, a competition, um, an international competition in, um, in, with Internet Society and Ghana placed third place all over the world um, because it was evident that this was a very good way of connecting the people who are unconnected. So I, I'm bringing, I, I'm just giving an example of these projects, although these are not AI projects, I'm just giving an example. So we have an overview of the kind of projects and then we look at the context of the barriers that we will face. Um, if we are moving into AI, AI for D, um, we are going to look at certain use cases that um, we plan to work on. Um, for the students, you have heard this already from yesterday. So monitoring animal health status and monitoring crop health and status, um, AI irrigation pumps, and then text to speech, which Vlad has already talked about. Um, so with, with the, the first two, we are looking at the idea of, um, of monitoring animals visually and um, through pictures and through um, uh, videos and possibly also through audio and using um, some data mining of, of information on the species or machine learning from crowdsourcing information to be able to detect disease in an animal or to be able to detect the health status of an animal. And then we're also looking at the same um, kind of application for crops. Um, we're also looking at um, AI irrigation pumps. So we have irrigation pumps that are automated um, that would probably water at certain times of the day. But we are looking to take this a step further to have um, irrigation pumps that are actually connected to sensors that take into account um, humidity and temperature. And um, if there has been rain before and the, the exact climate um, and the exact crop it is watering and factor all these things in to determine how much water the, the plants should have. And then, of course, lastly, we're looking at the text to speech that um, Vlad has spoken about. So these are the kind of um, projects that we want to look at. And as we can see, a, not, a lot of these have the context of being done in low resource environments, even including the text to speech, because um, the, the languages we are looking for are under resource languages. And so we have that context of um, having to work in a low resource environment. And so because of this reason, we are going to encounter certain problems. And um, going further with students who are doing this course and with researchers who will go on to do um, other projects, we need to know that there are certain issues we are going to face. And we're going to look at just a, a few of these. And these are the very same issues that have been faced in all the other projects that we have we have run, all the other projects that have gone on. So connectivity is one, one issue, literacy, um, context, that is um, the knowledge representation and adaptation. Electricity, of course, is a, a big, can be a big issue. Maintenance of the system that you create and then the cost of the system. That is the setup cost and the running cost. All right, so let's take a look at connectivity. Um, 
as um, Andre mentioned in his, um, his presentation, it, there can be the assumption that there is uh, an availability of, of connections. There's 5G, there's 4G. Um, that can, there can be that assumption because in the global north, um, in, in developed countries, this is sometimes the as assumption. But when we work in low resource um, environments, we have to come to the understanding that we do not always have um, connectivity available. Sometimes 4G simply does not exist. Um, in certain places, you might get um, some data connectivity, but not that fast or not good enough. Um, definitely no Wi-Fi. Um, uh, in pla some places, you would have, um, using Ghana as an example, at least most places will have a, GMS, a GSM connection. So at least everyone has a mobile phone. Um, our, our mobile phone penetration in Ghana is about um, 130, over 130 percent, meaning that um, we actually have more mobile phones than we have people. Um, so basically, every everyone has a mobile phone because the GSM networks at least are available in every um, everywhere. Please note, I said available, not reliable. Um, so sometimes they, they are not, even they are not that reliable. And then um, SMS definitely is available also. And then, um, and then we, we move into older technology like SMS and then um, radio FM, which is even more widely available. So one of the solutions to looking at connectivity is to, to dial, move a step back and look at the older technologies or the more wildly used, widely used technologies as opposed to attempting to do things like, like 4G connections because they might simply not exist. Um, so for example, with, um, with RadioNet, we had to deploy these Raspberry Pis which were running um, Casadaka, which is um, from Andre's project which were running the Casa Daca in the rural areas. And we left these devices in the rural areas where they can broadcast the information that is being sent to them. So we call into the device, there is a, it records the, the call, and then it broadcasts that call to the people. Um, now, we, once this was set up, we needed a way to get to know what is happening on the device. Um, but yet we knew very well that these devices are in places where there is little to no data connectivity. So, but we still need to get some information back from it. So the solution here was simply to use SMS. Um, so each, each system was, um, was programmed with a, a script that is um, reading any SMS that comes into the device. And then it takes that SMS, of course, from a particular phone number, not from just any random phone number. Um, and it assumes that that message coming in is, uh, is a, a command on the command line. And then it will run that command on its command line, get the output, and then send it back over SMS back to the number that sent it. So for example, as you can see in the picture, um, there is a, a command sent LS, and the, the, um, the, the folder name that is to list the files in that particular folder. And then it runs this command on the, the, the Raspberry Pi in the raw area, gets the information and sends it back over SMS. So this was a, a way of circumventing the issue of not having um, 4G and still managing to move data in and out. So, we, so basically we need to compensate for availability and reliability. So when you build your AI systems, and if these systems need to be in rural areas or in areas where connectivity is not readily available, you need to understand that um, it, this has to be a system that is not always, that does not always have access to the internet and so cannot do certain things on the fly um, and maybe might get access sometimes to the net and then has to update at that point. Um, and so we have to always factor all these uh, into our solutions. Um, next is literacy. This is uh, probably a very big one. Um, a lot of, of, of deployments that we will do um, in low resource environments will be to aid people who might not actually be literate, at least literacy in our terms. 
when we say literacy, we are basically talking about reading and writing and especially reading and writing in the languages that are available online or available internationally, so i.e. English. And, um, and so it means that we're going to encounter a lot of end users who are not literate. They do not write or they do not read English. And so meaning that our systems have to take this into account. So as we build the systems, for example, um, um, Gosa's project, um, which was um, Dig Digivet some years back, um, I think Andre mentioned that you would see that in the, the, there was a visual representation as opposed to a text representation. Um, because you are, although you are using maybe a screen or a smartphone, um, but you are encountering people who might not be able to read and write. And so visual representations are important. Um, local languages are important, as Vlad has showed us. And as he mentioned um, on the, the interface that he has shown us, it would be best if the, even the text was changed to the local language. And so that when, the, when someone from that local language comes across it, it is more, um, is readily identified as something that is his. And then also it is um, not in a language the person doesn't understand. And then lastly, voice technologies. Again, as Vlad mentioned, that it might even be better to record the prompt, um, even the, the, the headings, rather than just have them in text. Reason being that um, not everyone can actually read even the local language that they speak. And so if they can hear it in their language, then it is um, far better than just having to read. So in our, in our AI deployments, we have to consider the user interfaces. Um, as much as we are looking at the, I mean, when, when we say AI, we immediately zoom into the back end and we're looking at what happens in the background, but we must consider the, the user interface that meets the user and um, note that the person might not be able to read or write or um, understand English. And so we must consider voice technologies as well. Flowing from um, visual representations, we are going to have a problem of context. Now, um, I often like using these two examples um, for the understanding of knowledge representation. So the first one is our save symbol. I am um, relatively sure that most people online right now listening to this probably know what this blue symbol means because you have seen it before. Um, there was a day um, recently I was wondering whether the, new, the newer generation even understand what this means because there are no diskettes anymore. I'm sure the children of even 15 years have probably never seen diskettes before and they probably wonder what that then is but but they grew up to see it as being the symbol for save so they assume that it means something um, but but the older people we use diskettes and we know what they are now if we come to um, places where there wasn't internet or there wasn't um, these kind of technologies until probably just um, 10 years back or so um, people from there probably have no idea what this symbol means. So if you use this symbol in a, a, a solution that is supposed to represent saving, um, the people, the end users of your product may not understand what it means. So this is one aspect of knowledge rep representation that um, we must understand that um, it must be in context of the people that we are deploying for. And so we need to, to find visual aids that they understand. The second example is um, these, this thumbs up symbol. This is the, the thumbs up emoji from Skype. And I am very sure that once I put this on, all the Ghanaians um, probably took a step back and were wondering why is he insulting us, all right? Because this, sim this uh, movement is actually um, historically an insult in probably every Ghanaian culture. Um, and so if you just deploy a, some, uh, an animation like this in, a, in your deployment to meet your end users, um, you might realize that you are insulting them as opposed to thinking that you are doing a thumbs up. Um, this might probably be better because this is very different from this. 
So th these are things that you would need to understand in context of the particular place that you are deploying your application. And so because of that, I say that early end user inv involvement is very important. Um, you need to speak to your end users, you need to speak to your stakeholders to know exactly what kind of um, knowledge representation is, is right for that particular context. These are just basic examples, but they are, they are bigger things that you need to consider as you, you, you um, deploy ICT for development solutions. Um, next, of course, electricity. Um, it is, um, I mean, it's nice to talk about artificial intelligence, but we must remember that it, artificial intelligence definitely requires electricity at all times to be able to, to work. But unfortunately, we are going to encounter situations that we have places that we need to deploy systems where there is not constant electricity. Um, for a country like Ghana, I'm sorry to say that, um, that, that, that even in our urban areas, we do not constantly have electricity. And so any deployment that you do would have to compensate for the ability of electricity. So um, the various ways is considering that your system must be recoverable. So if, if the power should go off on your AI system, um, it should be a system built such that it does not crash. And so it must be a robust system, both um, with the hardware or with the electricals and with um, the, the software such that once it goes down and comes back up, it should be able to return to exactly where it was before. Um, this might not be a, a big consideration in a place where, where the developer knows that there will always be electricity and his system will always be, be, be online. Um, but this becomes more important when you know that for about one hour, your AI system will be down. And when it comes back up, it must be able to adapt. An example I can give is, let's say, the AI irrigation pump. So assuming that the pump is, is watering um, in a cycle where it, is, it has begun watering, um, if it loses power, when it comes back on, a system like that should um, immediately will immediately have to go back to take the, 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 go back to its sensors to take data so that it can know the current situation on the ground, but not immediately resume watering. Otherwise you have a, you would probably have a flooded farm somewhere because the power went off and came back on. Um, one, one other solution is alternative power sources. So we think of um, windmills and solar power and, um, so, for example, when we deployed um, the radio nets, we added um, solar panels and power banks so that they could always have electricity. Um, um, maybe to also note, well, in connection between electricity and maintenance, that one, one um, interesting thing happened when we, when we did that with our system. Um, so when we, when we got back and we were the, we, we made the system to keep sending, sending me data of what the system was doing. Um, when I analyzed the system, I realized that um, it didn't have 100% uptime, um, but I think the uptime was about 75%. Um, and it was constant for every device. And yet these devices were in different rural communities, five different communities. So it was weird because we we're wondering how come we have about 75% uptime in five communities that have no connection. And then we realized the reason why. So what happened was that um, in the evening, the people who were tasked with keeping the system didn't see the need for the system to be on throughout the night. So they simply turned them off. And so for about eight hours, the system was off and in the morning they turned it back on. And so eight hours were lost out of our 24 hours. And so we in our urban area were, were very confused as to what happened. And so this is another, another um, it's not really electricity per se, but maybe it comes down to maintenance and also the understanding again of context. Um, the people don't see the need for a system to be up during the night when they are sleeping. And um, we in our urban areas feel that our internet must be up because at 2 a.m. I might wake up with a brilliant idea and I need to go online. And, but they would just not do that. So, um, so these are the kind of contextual issues that we need to. So we come to maintenance. Um, 
our systems must be low maintenance. So for example, with the, with the example I gave, they could turn the system on and off, but basically that was it. Once they turn it on, it comes on, it does all its checks and it immediately starts to run. So um, because the reason being that your end users might not have technical know-how, and so you might need to deploy, uh, again, uh, an AI pump in a place, in a rural place that has no technical know-how. And so the system must be able to man basically maintain itself, or at least the, the user must be able to do very basic things to maintain it. Um, if you are deploying a system that checks um, the health of animals or, or crops, then you, we are probably using a smartphone, but then you probably need to have a UI interface that once the smartphone comes on, um, the interface immediately comes on, as opposed to providing lots of icons that will confuse the user. And it immediately comes on and the user can just point his camera at the animal or crop and immediately get something out of it without having to figure out what else to do. Um, for this, what one, another, another aspect you need is stakeholder involvement. Um, and that is why we work with a lot of NGOs and with a lot of um, institutions, so like UDS, Unimas, and um, we, we work with Caltribe and, and the Savannah Agricultural Research Institute, because when these stakeholders are involved, they can probably be helpful in the maintenance of the systems as well. And then lastly, your systems need to be robust, um, especially with hardware. The hardware needs to be robust systems because you might leave these systems in rural areas. You might leave these systems in the hands of people who might not um, exactly know how to handle them properly. And so um, you must have real robust, robust systems. Um, if you send, um, for example, um, I'm not sure of these days, but um, a lot of smartphones, um, when they fall down immediately, the, the, their screens are going to get cracked um, because it is assumed that the users are not people who will drop them that easily. Um, but, but to deploy smartphones for rural communities or for um, monitoring animals, it, it might, it, you might consider that the people who do this might easily drop them. And so you are looking for more robust hardware to use as opposed to systems that might break down. Um, and then lastly, um, of course, there are more, more things, but I am focusing on, on thin, um, the barriers that we have encountered that are, that are very um, at the forefront. And lastly, and probably very importantly, is cost. Um, cost can, can simply derail a solution because the solution is, is marvelous, it works, it's perfect. It's an, uh, a, a complicated AI, AI interface that works marvelously, but then the cost is so high that no one can afford it. And that defeats the whole purpose. And um, so we have to look at um, two, two directions of cost. That is first setup cost. Um, which involves the hardware you would use, the software that, that will run it. And then we also have to look at running cost, which involves the sustainability of the system. And um, for this, the, the, the um, solutions is that the, the hardware we use must be affordable. Um, so if, for example, if we are going to use um, smartphones for let's say our first two use cases, um, we, we, we cannot afford to, to, to focus on phones like, um, like um, iPhones or, or Pixels or, or, or Samsung S, S10s. I mean, if, if you're going to expand this to more communities, then that means that this gets more expensive as you expand. You're going to have to figure out the balance between, um, between good hardware that can run your system and affordable hardware that is not too expensive. Um, and then when it comes to the software, we would have to um, simply stay away from software that requires um, too much um, of, of, of cost and, and focus more on open source, um, mainly such that so that we don't have to have um, too much problems financially in building up the systems. And also so that when people want to upscale our systems and reuse our systems, it can easily be done without having um, to, to uh, 
to talk to big tech and um, other companies that would benefit from um, pro projects that are supposed to be for development specifically. And finally, we would need a financially sustainable model. Um, I, I believe us, our students will probably go through this in the next coming weeks, but your system has to be financially sustainable in that um, there must be a flow of where the finance moves. If, if, if there needs to be investment of money into the system, then that money must come from somewhere. Somebody must pay for it. And, and you need to figure out how this is going to work. And to go one first, um, step further, I would say that even in your software design, you need to factor in the, the financial sustainability and kind of figure out what kind of um, design of software would make financial sustainability better. And um, how, would I, how can I benefit the people? So for example, with um, voice technologies, you could consider the trade-off between the caller, the, the, the end user calling into the system, um, as opposed to the end user flashing the system that is um, making a call and cutting it immediately, and the system calling back to the person. These are software solutions to finances. So these are things that we need to consider as we, we build our AI systems. Um, so so in, in, in conclusion, these issues, they are, we, our AI systems um, are, can be perfect. We can do all kinds of wonderful things. But as we do these things, we need from the very beginning. And I would advise um, um, students and people who would go on to do these kind of projects, do not wait till the end or the middle to begin to consider these issues. These are issues you need to start with because they would advise how the, the process of, of developing these um, solutions would go. So your connectivity, literacy, context, electricity, maintenance costs. And apart from these, as you go on, you would realize that there are even other barriers that you need to consider. And these would help us at the end of the day come up with AI systems that can benefit people who are even in low resource environments. So thank you for your time. And um, if we have the time, any thoughts or questions? Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much for an excellent uh, presentation and story and, and very interesting for us to, to hear about all your experience during years and years of field research in uh, ICT4D. Um, so I open the floor for questions. Who, uh, who wants to ask a question to Francis, please um, let yourself know. Yeah, first question. Uh, this is uh, from Musa from Unimas. Uh, Francis, you talk, a lot, you talk about a lot on AI, but what is your plan here? Can you, can you tell us how many projects you have? Because it looks like you have been talking about a lot on AI, but I could not find what is the main topics you, you are planning to do. Or you have done before. <clears throat> Um, oh, you yes. Can, um, you can, you can. Yes, well, yes, true, because I have done a lot of, of projects. These are projects that I have already um, worked on. Uh, but, well, personally, uh, Mr. Meteo and um, RadioNet are my projects. Um, all of these have been, been done and deployed and um, tested and, uh, um, and gotten information from. Um, Mr. Meteo was kind of incorporated into RadioNet um, such that people can get clim um, climate um, information through that system as well. At the moment, the um, Internet Society, which, was, uh, Ms., uh, which RadioNet was a competition of, um, is actually working to um, provide more funding so that we can upscale it to more communities to receive information. Yes. So basically, th these are my projects, but mainly my, my talk is, is focused on our students having an idea of the, the, the barriers they will face in their upcoming deployments and, uh, and from the experience that I have and the ways that they can go about in circumventing these barriers when they come up. Okay, uh, but uh, 
radio, what, what do you tell to the people who, through radio? What, how do you communicate with the people through radio? Yes, what, so, what um, all right, so maybe I should explain it technically um, first and then uh, maybe logistically. So technically what, what, hap what we did was, um, so Casadaka, which is um, Andre's project, is, uh, is a system that kind of uh, we, is installed on a Raspberry Pi. Um, with a, a normal USB dongle. So it's able to receive um, you, um, GSM calls, so you can call into the system. So what I did to further it is to simply record the incoming message. Um, and then um, the Raspberry Pi is also, um, thank, um, um, thankfully have a FM modulator, which can broadcast FM signals. Um, so any um, audio files on the Raspberry Pi can be broadcast over FM frequencies. Um, you just simply connect a, a, a cable to a particular port and then it pro provides like an antenna. So it broadcasts over about 120 meters radius or so. So, um, so, from our, so from our stakeholders, there will be a call to leave information to the community, and then the device would broadcast that recorded information, which is in their local language, over FM frequencies, and then the people in the rural areas just listen to the information. Now, um, logistically, what happens is that the stakeholders, uh, which for my project was the Savannah Agricultural Research Institute, um, th basically their job is to get information to farmers and to communicate with them. So this was a project that actually helped them because then they were able to simply make calls to the system and then the system broadcast these calls over frequencies, the FM frequencies to the community. And then of course, we also added the information that comes from, from climate information for that particular community. So for example, to tell them in their local language that um, tomorrow there's a likelihood that there will be a heavy rain. And then so they know that that the forecast for tomorrow is heavy rain. And so this is what the project was basically doing. So it is more on community-based projects, OK, I understand. Yes. So for the student case, I think my advice is to have to uh, revise uh, projects, which actually help is whatever you have done so far, and then uh, plan next level. So when it comes to research, I think it will be OK, but you have to always the cost, as you say, you have a, a cost constraint, but always yes. uh, so this project actually, if you have a system running already and it's going to involve those, those projects, I believe so, then you may actually uh, uh, upgrade whatever you have done. And that upgrading will have to do with the titles of the project you're giving to the student. I think that is my comment on it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very uh, much. Thank you, well, Prof. Well done. Thank you both. Um, more questions, please. Are there more people with a question to Francis? I'm not seeing them on the chat. The students should have questions for Francis because they are going to tackle the use cases in the next coming days. So they're going to work on use cases related to the three um, that uh, Francis presented. So the DigiVet or the local language or the irrigation pumps. Uh, so they, they must have some question <laughs> out there. Hello, Francis. Yes, hello, Samuel, yeah. Yes, uh, I just have one question. In your previous uh, uh, um, program that you did, the Metro and the rest, and when you are broadcasting the information to that particular community, is it one particular language that they use or they use various language? Because you know in Ghana, me like a Southerner, I can move to the North as I am here. If I don't understand the language and I want to engage in farming and the language is being broadcast in, let's say, in Dagbani and I don't understand Dagbani, how will I be able to get that information and decode it and able to use it? 
Yes, all right, thank you. So, um, so well, yes, yeah, so this is a good question because this, this actually in a broader context is more about, um, is, 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 is more about the contextual issue of there being multiple languages in the community. Um, unfortunately, in this, um, in this project, we focused on the major language for that particular community. Um, and that normally um, in, in, in the projects that I have done is, um, is, is the, the best way is from finding out from the community members themselves. Um, so which language do you think that would be best to serve this community? And most likely they can give you the best answer um, simply because you might not be able to provide for every single person. So for example, and, and in Ghana on our radio stations, not every language is spoken, um, only some particular languages. And how are these languages selected based on the majority of people? And unfortunately, they can't cover every language. As I mentioned um, to the students yesterday, um, Ghana has about over 250 different dialects. And so, of course, it's impossible for us to tackle every single. So the best way is focus on what the people say is the best thing. Unfortunately, that means that you might, as you're saying, miss a few people, one or two people. But considering the fact that most um, for these deployments, most of these places were um, very rural areas, um, it is sometimes most unlikely. And based on the data that um, I took from them, you'd realize that almost everyone speaks the same language and just one or two people somewhere would speak a different language. So, um, so these are the, the trade-offs. Trade sometimes, sometimes it's unfortunately impossible to reach everyone as we would want to. Okay, uh, so there's another question. Um, there's a question from Gideon. And he says, apart from weather information, what else information is made available for the local people in terms of their occupation? Um, okay, yes. Um, so um, again, a good question contextually. Um, so for, for this particular, uh, particular project, the main um, information was actually farming practices and not weather information um, because uh, reason being that um, the the information was was um was we got the info the information that we should send from the people themselves so the question to the people was what kind of information do you want and not what what information do i have to give you so we we are doing this in the context of um, trying to picture ourselves and the internet so for example if i open up um, my google chrome and i go to google.com I am going to search for what I want and not what Google wants me to want. And so in the same context, the, the people in the rural area should be able to tell us what they want to hear. And then we get that information from them as opposed to we giving them information that we feel like giving them. And so, um, so the end users can help us with this. The, the stakeholders can also help us know that the kind of information that we should give. Um, but to go back to the context of, of, of this particular project, so basically it was farming practices, and then we added the weather information as a way of um, tying in um, Mr. Meteor to it. Okay, hope that, that answers the question. Professor Nara has a question. Sarnara, I see your hands raised, but you are still, your microphone is still. Uh, I forgot to unmute, sorry. All right, uh, so I just want to say thank you very much for all the sessions. I really enjoyed myself listening to uh, the uh, master's projects and also uh, especially uh, Francis, uh, amazing presentation. You know, I, I mean, I just need to say, uh, that I'm proud to be uh, associated with uh, well Hans, Anna, and your group, and also I mean uh, today I mean as I've seen the tremendous work y'all are doing in Africa. I think uh, these are milestone projects. I mean because we're just at times just saying 
uh, technology stops us and yet we do it another way. You know, that's, that's what we are fighting every moment. And all the things you say, these are success stories. So I have to say, wow, right? But uh, I mean, these are on, not only the projects, but I, I think there are three things that we need to take home today. I think uh, one for the students and also for all of us here. Uh, firstly, uh, the community, they do not know about technology and they are left out. And sometimes you cannot bridge the gap fully, but by bringing a project, we bring hope. And that is a tremendous transformation and well done for that. And uh, secondly, for the student who goes through this project, their lives are changed because they now understand people. They understand the story of people, the suffering of people need to be conscientious, caring. You know, I think that that will transform them for life. And I think the students, I think I have a message for you. When you choose a project, think of what are the things of uh, permanent impact that you can leave to a community way beyond uh, this post pandemic period. I mean, you know, just think about the next 20 years, you know, what is it, what small thing that you can do to make a big impact on the lives of many, right? For now and for a long time. So just think uh, seriously. I think all of you have a powerful tool of IT and AI. You can do wonders by just building things on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Nara. Uh, thanks for your yeah for your words uh, and uh, for your participation also in, uh, in 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 this project. Uh, we will hear more from you tomorrow. Uh, your presentation. We're looking forward to it. So um, there is another question by Maria. Um, maybe Maria, can can you can you just um, um, tell your ask your your question directly to Francis? Yes, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I uh, repeat uh, my quest, I, I brought in my question uh, through the chat uh, in order to make easier, you know, because otherwise I'm always asking and keeping time, you know, so, well, but I will um, read it. So a suggestion to improve the interviews with the citizens would be uh, short questions uh, with a specific words related to the main uh, aim of the, the case studio? Um, yes, so, um, well, uh, yes, uh, well, maybe for the other people who were not with us yesterday, who probably uh, uh, see the question out of context, um, that, that we had a, a Lect a lecture from Hans yesterday on interviewing. And so this is related to that in connection with, with what I have just said. And um, yes, so I think, yes, you, you are right. The, the best, that, that's the best way. Um, but as, as um, Prof Nara just mentioned, um, sometimes the people have no idea of the technologies that you're talking about. And so um, it has to be introduced in a way that, um, would make them have a broad understanding of, of what you can achieve or what you intend to achieve, but also try not to um, influence them and bias their answers in a certain way. Um, um, sorry, I know that this sounds vague and, and difficult, um, but maybe to give an example. Um, so for example, with voice technologies, um, in, in our projects, we, we simply let them know that uh, we can provide information to you um, in your language. I mean, basically that is it. Um, so the rest of the, and, and this, this in, in, in context kind of sum, summarizes my whole project. I am providing voice uh, based information to you in your language. Although if you look at the technical side, it's, it's, I, it's very, very different, um, but I don't, really talk about that with them. And once I have mentioned that, and then the, the rest of the information, as you said, with short questions, will, they will begin to tell you, for example, what kind of information we think we, we need to hear, what kind of language we think it should be in, um, maybe even what kind of medium it should come in. Um, they, they, they could be the best determinants. 
Um, and so if we move into, let's say, our use cases that we, we are doing in, in AI, um, um, so for example, we, 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 we want to help you figure out when your animal has a disease. I mean, that's basically it. And then the, the short questions that follow will kind of tease out the information from, from them and you can figure out the rest from there. So, uh, so I think there's another question. In Ghana, there have been persistent um, annual army worms that destroy crops. Uh, yes, so um, how can this technology help? All right, so actually when we were talking about the first use case, um, I think this is, oh, I'm sorry, the second use case, this is actually uh, one of the, 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 the reasons why it came up. So um, actually they have, in Ghana for the past number of years, there has been um, army worms attacks on certain crops. And um, well, at the end of the day, this question, um, I'm going to be a typical lecturer and then say that this question is kind of has to go back to students to be, uh, to be a question that you need to answer in your upcoming research. Um, because we, we have given a use case that says, um, that, that says use AI to determine um, plants, plant health. Um, but then in, in context, you can go further and probably focus on armyworms in particular, and then maybe try to figure out um, how to have early detection of armyworms or try to detect um, uh, when a plant is being attacked by armyworms, even if the worms themselves are not uh, present, or try to figure out how these two things can help. One way would be that you need to talk to the experts and the end users, the people who actually face this problem and others who are involved in fighting armyworms to find out from them, what do you do to fight these worms? How can we help with this, this kind of technology that we have? And they are the best people to answer the question. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Francis. Um, I think we have run through the questions and that brings us to the end of our day. So I, uh, Gideon, you still have a question, Francis? Uh, I think uh, we have already answered that. Um, yes, yeah, so, so I have just a, a few, few remarks about tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll start at the same time as today. So that is uh, 8.30 for Ghana, that is 10.30 for the Netherlands, and that is um, 4.30 in the afternoon for Malaysia and uh, Indonesia. Um, so we will have tomorrow, today we had this, this very nice overview of AI, starting with AI in general, what is AI, examples of AI, and then AI, machine learning applied to West African narratives and stories, and then uh, Francis story AI in low resource environments and specific, the, the user uh, aspects of it and the contextual aspects of, of building information systems and in particular AI systems in low resource environments and, and all the experience that he had. So I think we had um, uh, also the, the intermezzo by, by Flood, which was interesting to, to uh, really um, start to participate in, in a project. Uh, so that, uh, that makes it very interactive and, and we can all share our yeses and nos in all our, our languages to uh, Flood's project and help him uh, fill his, uh, his data gap. Um, so uh, we will continue to do that. Uh, so the, the, the voicesradas.nl is open for all your uh, utterances. Uh, yes and no, of course. <laughs> um, yes, so, so that, that, uh, that was an uh, excellent day. I think the students must have learned a lot about uh, AI and, and the applicability of it for and in the Global South. Um, so tomorrow we will continue. We will have three speakers tomorrow. That is Chris van Aert and from, from industry. He's an AI expert and he has his own uh, firm, uh, the most innovative uh, AI firm in the Netherlands. Uh, it, it has been really, uh, it has been uh, rated uh, amongst the three most innovative companies in uh, tech companies in the Netherlands for uh, in 2020. Uh, then we have, uh, and, and Chris will talk 
about knowledge engineering and management dealing with the specialist knowledge. So that's the explainable AI, as, uh, as uh, Andre also explained. Uh, then, then we have Frank Bennis, and he will, uh, he's from the FU, and he will talk about data analytics for patient health monitoring. So that will be a, a, a health uh, application of artificial intelligence. And then we will have uh, Professor Nara, who will um, present us, and uh, he will talk about digital socio-technical innovation and indigenous knowledge in Southeast Asia group. So that's that's very interesting, and we are really looking forward to these interesting talks. Um, so I hope to see you all back tomorrow. We had uh, we had almost eighty people today in this webinar, which is which is fantastic, and I think. Uh, from uh, at least six different countries uh, in three different continents. So uh, I think we, we had a very nice um, meeting and I hope you enjoyed it all. Everybody liked it. I think the connectivity was fine. As, as far as I know, everyone has been able to, uh, to, to participate and to hear and to uh, make post questions and, and look at the videos. So that was uh, that was uh, successful, and I hope that uh, we will have luck with the telecom tomorrow as well. Um, so I thank you all very much for your participation, and I hope to see you back um, tomorrow morning and afternoon. 